Hey climbers, welcome back to Climb by VSC, a weekly show about building and scaling startups in the world of climate innovation. My name is Jacob Poor, general partner of VSC Ventures and co-host of Climb. Every week, I or a member of our VSC team will speak with a pioneer in the climate tech world about emerging technologies and novel ideas that will turn the tide on climate change. We've all heard enough of the doom and gloom. It's time for stories of purpose-driven innovation that lead to sustainable, positive change. As always, I'm so happy that you've decided to join us. Now let's climb. Hey, climbers, welcome back to another episode of Climb by VSC. I am so excited to have on uh, one of our co-investors uh, here at VSC Ventures, Abe Murray. Abe is a general partner uh, and he's leading robotics investments and incubation at Alicorp Robotics. Abe has had more than 20 years of engineering experience, having spent time uh, in product and engineering at various roles in Alphabet, um, where he launched playbooks and magazines at Android. He built the Verily Life Science product teams, the Boston Office, and he shipped several AI, ML, and computer vision products ac across Google uh, before doing what he's doing now. Uh, he's also been an entrepreneur before that. Um, Abe and I have looked at several investments together. We've made one recently. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of had a sense of you know, some of the, the things I wanted to chat with him about, but I know that this is going to be a far-ranging conversation on uh, both robotics and climate. So uh, Abe, I am so excited to have you on Climb finally. Thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is podcast number three for me, so I still don't know what I'm doing, but it's super fun to have a chat with you, Jay. I feel like these are just, I get to talk to amazing people like yourself. We hit the record button and, and share it with others, and I think that's just a pretty special thing to make happen. I, I love the spirit that you're bringing to this already, man. So let's, uh, let's set it up a, a little bit more for our audience that isn't familiar um, with your background as much. How did your experience founding a you know, Web 2.0 startup, working in the defense industry with unmanned aerial vehicles, drive you to leading investments in robotics now at Alicorp? I've got a list of five things that matter to me. I've got three kids. We were just chatting about that. I want the world to be good for the people who are entering it. And I worry about a handful of things that really matter, right? And so for me, my list is energy and climate, food from the family business, like we got to eat, education, we need more humans unleashed to fix things, health, like what's the point of being here if we can't be healthy and have a nice lifetime? And by the way, we're bankrupting our countries by getting it wrong. And then productivity in general, if you think about how do we you know, enable billions of people to join us in the middle class um, without tanking the environment, right? We're already not doing a great job. We need more people to live as well as we do. And we need to do that, you know, in a positive way. Those things are all important to me. And I've worked on those at every step of my career, taking that ownership perspective to it. Um, when I met Kevin Ryan at Alicorp and he was talking to me about wanting to build a robotics fund, it just rang bells in my head. I'm a thousand percent on board with that because I believe that robotics and automation underpin every one of those five things I care about and are enabled by a bunch of the things that I worked on in my career. So by yeah. working on robotics and automation, I think we get to tackle climate change. I think we get to ensure that future generations eat well, eat better maybe than we did. I think we grew up in the mass food production, but it's not great food kind of world. Maybe a generation from now, we can have even larger food production and it's all organic and healthy food. How do we yeah. make that happen? Robots and automation. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll click in there a little bit more because I think um, there's always that, that VC mantra of, you know, the best companies are built when they are non-consensus and right, right? And robotics and hardware at this moment, 2023, um, I know, you know, you and I really dig in on it, but for a lot of VCs is non-consensus. I mean, so many funds have been burned investing in high capex, hardware-led startups in the, in the pretty recent past. So what tailwinds or factors did you kind of see in the market that excited you about building a, a robotics-focused fund now? I'll share my perspective in a minute, but I'm really enabled by Kevin Ryan, who built Alicorp, and Alicorp's unique take on things. So Alicorp, as you know, is an early stage investor, pre-seed and seed. They come in early, they back first time founders, and they build companies. So they're incubators, they create things from scratch and, and really live at that betting on what's the world gonna look like 10 years from now. Because when you're coming in that early, your exits are way down the road. Uh, and Kevin's done a great job living that life, doing you know well by his companies, and in some ways reading the trends. And the things that he saw that got him excited about this 
we're demographics and labor shortages. We can't put that genie back in the bottle. All of our companies struggle with that. And we see that across the world. COVID exacerbated it, but this existed pre-COVID. We still have this challenge. Um, the cost of labor, somewhat related to that first point, but a higher labor cost is great for everybody, right? That means we're getting paid better. That also means there's more space to bring automation to do things, to unleash humans on these higher paid, higher quality jobs. And then two other changes that, that we see. One is, I think it's at least 5X, it's probably not 10X, but it's getting there, a, a serious reduction in the cost of this hardware. So if you were building a robotics company 10 years ago, you probably had to spend a significantly larger chunk of your equity dollars building the hardware for that company. Today, it's a different world. We have things like the NVIDIA Jetson computer, like CPU has gotten better and cheaper. Uh, the motors have gotten better and cheaper. Like just across the board, it takes less to build prototypes and it takes less to build manufacturing production runs. So that's all positive. And on the back of that, you see the software capabilities have certainly improved by an order of magnitude over the last decade as well. I've lived this, you've been investing in companies doing this. We see that AI, computer vision, and so on lets you do a lot more with the hardware. So we think a combination of the markets are ready for this and the hardware and software can meet the demand. This must happen. But more fundamentally, we just don't see how a world 10 years from now doesn't have significantly more robotics and automation in it. If we're going to tackle climate change, if we're going to feed more people like those things we talked about, just demand that this happens. Um, and that's a, a final point where I'm very grateful for Alicorp and the way that they think about the world. Uh, they make those 10 year bets. We come in early and, and we believe that we can get there. And they've lived that successfully with examples like MongoDB, which went at databases when people thought databases weren't something you could innovate in, but they saw that something had changed in that and that five plus years from now, you know, these internet companies, Web 2.0 companies were going to go big and demand a new kind of database. So we see that happening in robotics and automation. Yeah. Do you think the, the capital environment in that world is changing too? I think for a long time, the, the big concerns were, you know, there aren't venture scale outcomes here because either there aren't software like margins or um, maybe there are, but the amount of capital that it takes to get to those, you know, just kind of precludes folks from having those massive unicorn style exits. So yes, you may have unicorn robotics companies, but it took 200, 250 million to get there. And maybe that wasn't a great outcome for investors. Is your perspective on that, that that, that market is changing or are some of those constraints just inherent when you're building in the world of, you know, atoms, not bits? One thought is before I was doing this, I had spent a year and a half in Android doing, you know, work with, you know, tablets and, and, and cool stuff at scale. And before that, five years in health tech building, you know, chronic disease management, value-based care, and actually deploying a bunch of medical devices. Robots and automation aren't the only business where CapEx is required to scale. And, and frankly, even, you know, some more traditional businesses, as they get big, they actually need a lot of CapEx financing to do things like, you know, a really simple example. If I was a, you know, commercial uniforms company and I'm selling uniforms to UPS, you know, I've got to ship and deploy those before they pay me for them. So I'd say it's not unique to our industry. It was probably harder when the stuff that we were building and shipping was ridiculously expensive. When a robot arm was $100,000, shipping those costs a lot of money. When they're $10,000 now, uh, it's actually easier to get through it. And it starts to look more like traditional businesses. Um, the other thing I'll say is I've seen a number of companies that are building such high value products uh, that deliver such value for their customers that they actually have really respectable margins. So very fast ROI on that CapEx deployment. And once you've built the business, so there's a certainly a trough, right? The first couple of years when you're building, you haven't got revenues, you haven't, you know, proven that this machine can turn the crank, equity dollars are going to go into hardware. But once you really start to scale, if you've picked your business right and you're providing you know, 10x the value that you're capturing and you're capturing a really strong margin with that value, these can be really great businesses. Uh, if you're a year or two down the road of shipping product and growing and showing these margins are real, banks will finance you. So I think that we can get there and, and our job as investors is to help our companies get through those intervening years. I don't know that we have to build to hundreds of millions of dollars of 
CapEx, like traditional equity CapEx from VCs to get to really big outcomes. And I think yeah. that you did 10 years ago, right? I think that many of the, and I'm deeply appreciative of the companies that built before and showed that there were big returns here, even if they required those big CapEx build outs. Uh, I think that the next set of unicorns won't require the same amount of capital that the previous ones did. Yeah, I'll add to that too, Abe. I think, you know, the the answer that I have for a lot of, um, you know, co-investors when we send, send them an opportunity, specifically within climate, is, oh, you know, it, it'll take a lot of capital to get there. And I think you have to impress upon folks sometimes, like, but the scale of the opportunity is that much bigger, right? If we're yeah. just talking about robotics within warehouses, okay, sure, growing market, but but maybe a little saturated. You start talking about the opportunity within climate, you know, uh, within the grid, within alternative energy sources, within alternative materials that are being used in a factory setting. Like it is just now we're talking on the orders of tens of hundreds of billions. And so, sure, you know, even if it does take a little bit more capital in those early days to get there, I think you have to believe if you're going to make the investment, the, the size of the opportunity is is there. Dovetailing into that, you know, we, we were starting dip, dipping the toe around climate one of the things I find really cool about your portfolio is, I mean, what an intersection there is, right? Uh, Earth Force, Glacier, probably a, a whole host of ones that, that I'm not even mentioning. Um, what specifically about that subsector and like that convergence of climate and robotics really interests you? Because uh, it seems like you've had quite a bit of focus on it, uh, especially recently. I have, yeah. A couple of thoughts here. One is, my, my first answer was just selfishly, I care about it, right? I think that this is one of the big challenges our generation sees and that the people who I meet coming out of school want to work on. And so I think that there's a lot going on there and a lot of opportunity and it's fun. But my second thought, besides just me caring about it and looking for opportunities here, is that actually almost everything I look at is going to, if not directly, indirectly have a significant impact on climate. You know, you mentioned warehouses earlier. Warehouses were probably the first and best known robotics uh, win out there, Kiva Systems and then many others to follow. And so you might think that's a saturated space, not much to be done there. Actually, it's just early innings, less than 10% of warehouses are automated, so much to be done. And it's not just the warehouses, it's the last mile delivery, the you know intermediate mile delivery how we move goods around the world, that drives a massive amount of CO2 emissions, right? As I'm sure you know. So if you just step back and say, we have a CO2 problem, where is it all coming from? Almost every industry is culpable in some way. Logistics is deeply culpable. And so any robot tackling that is improving climate change because better productivity and efficiency means less CO2 release. So uh, some are working more directly. So as you mentioned, Earth Force working to prevent forest fires at scale Glacier, which we're working together in, uh, doing recycling robots. Well over half of my portfolio is directly working the problem. So others would be Civ Robotics, helping deploy solar at scale. Eric's helping prevent our utilities and oil and gas companies from destroying the environment through broken infrastructure. Um, Renovate Robotics, which is working on automating roofing and will be a you know solar build out. Dolagon, which is doing autonomy for off-road vehicles, is actually seeing demand from farmers, from wind farm owners, from solar farm owners who have to maintain these big, you know, this infrastructure at scale. So almost everything winds up there, um, even transportation, right? If we could use our cars better, again, cars drive a lot of CO2. If we could use them more efficiently, we'd make less of them. We'd have less CO2 release. And the reality is that autonomous cars have not rolled out at societal scale. They're not solving the problem yet. And if you ask people when that might happen at scale, when can you walk anywhere in this country and have autonomous vehicles solve the problem of transportation? You know, people still are saying it's, you know, 10 plus years out. So one of our first investments was in Mapless, which we think can deliver this in the very near term with more of a teleoperation human in the loop. So Everything we're doing is, I believe, mostly directly and sometimes indirectly um, showing up for this problem. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, one of the most, um, I think, common um, differentiations that a lot of our guests talk about between climate 1.0 and climate 2, 2.0 or whatever phase that we're in right now is that climate you know, 1.0 was so much about energy and climate 2.0 is so much about industry. And the, and the difference really being here and you know, talking about sort of indirect and direct impacts is that 
if you look at solutions at every piece of the industrial stack, as you just very eloquently laid out, right, it's not just warehousing, but it's logistics to and from. And it's not just getting supplies to and from, it's getting humans to and from. And at every piece of that, there is a carbon impact. Um, that's the that's the big difference here. And that's sort of, I think, as investors, right, not just folks that obviously care about this and like talking about it, but also as investors that have, you know, goals and targets for a return on investment, that's actually um, really, really exciting. You know, sometimes I think uh, meeting founders really admire uh, the the effort that some of these folks spend on, you know, building in the world of atoms, building hardware. Um, and I know you appreciate this because I've heard you say founders that, that build in robotics are playing the game on hard mode. So elaborate on that a little bit. What, what does that mean to you, Abe? Uh, and, and what is it about these hard mode founders that particularly attracts you? When I look at some of the, you know, the, the projections and spreadsheets, you look at the spend that we're going to need to do to prevent forest fires from, you know, happening at the scale they are, or the spend that we're going to need to do to maintain our infrastructure, even something as simple as maintaining the roads in this country, right? In terms of hard mode, it's really hard to show up with solutions, right? Almost the first question I always ask when I'm engaging with founders is, does it work? Because you can imagine that if it worked, there would be value for society, right? There would be value for the, the investors, there would be value for the founders. Great, we're off to the races. Um, but it's really hard to make this stuff work. And that's why I think it's hard mode. To, to build a robot that can drive around the, you know, let's say Boston where I live, um, you know, San Francisco, your neck of the woods, or New York where I was just earlier this week, and fill in the potholes, right? That would be nice. Uh, those roads are pretty rough. Uh, that's a hard robot to build, right? There's just so many components to it. And so you need hardware founders who understand what's possible, understand how to assemble a pretty complex machine. And then you need the software to unlock that machine, right? Have to know where you are, avoid hitting pedestrians, uh, have some sense of the, the larger city, right? So you have not just a software problem, you have a hardware problem. And then that's great. Even if you can build that machine, there's probably a near infinity of ways to drive a working machine into the ground and never see the light of day because you have to figure out how am I going to sell this machine to municipalities, to, you know, contractors, et cetera. So then you have to go raise money to enable all of this. And you have to find the small set of people who are living 10 years in the future, which not all investors are and yeah. find those people. And there aren't enough of them. So it, I think it is a hard space to work in. I think the wins are if you succeed, you get those really big industrial returns and you deliver huge societal value. As you evaluate these founders for investment, are there two to three things that you need to see from the founders specifically that convinces you that they're ready to play the game? The cliche is team. It's always going to be the first answer. Is this a phenomenal team? And there's many ways to measure that. For me, it's about, you know, the cliche, but a cliche because it's true is grit, right? Can this person keep going when things get hard? I've built a bunch of businesses. I've shipped a ton of product. Um, I've seen businesses fail. You know, the family business had ups and downs. My startup looked good and then it didn't. Anything you do is going to hit a brick wall at some point. Is this founder going to keep going? Do they have evidence of that in the past? Or are you making a bet that they are somebody who can do that? So getting a sense of them. So that's always a starting point. The other piece of that, which is team related, is, is this person going to be customer obsessed? Are they going to figure out, go to market? Are they going to build a thing the world needs? And in robotics, because it is hard, the people who tend to go down robotics paths tend to be hardware and software people who understand what they can do with this. They aren't always the people who want to go have 50 customer phone calls, understand what does the world need? I had this cool idea. I have to tweak it five degrees to meet what the world needs. That's the thing to figure out that's going to unlock these companies. Product market fit is always what you need. And I'm looking for people who think as much or more about that than they do about the technology. Yeah. Uh, and there's, a, there's an aspect of storytelling there too, Abe, like, and not, not to sort of like toot our own horn because this is what you know, we do. But part of the reason why I love working with robotics founders is like there's a, there's a level of 
I think self-reflection that that engineer like engineering focused founders have where they're like I know how to how to you know integrate these systems and I know how to get the robotic arm to pick up and drop and do this stuff what I maybe don't know how to do is to like help my customer understand at an emotional level why this is the right solution for them and I I actually find, I mean one it's it's sure it's a challenge for us and our team as we're doing the storytelling but two, I actually love when you have a founder that understands their strengths and, and where they're not so strong because one, you can help them hire for it. Two, you, you know, they'll, they'll sort of like hear you. And I, I think your, your point of like, yeah, it takes a different energy to go and have 50 customer calls. You're, you're in sales mode, you're in pitching mode and not every founder, you know, comes out of the box with with all of all of those skill sets. Um, it is an interesting challenge to have, but a very important one because, you know, um, as somebody says, like if your technical talent is at a 10 out of 10, but your communication skills are at a three out of 10, your customer is going to perceive that your technical is actually at a three out of 10. And so the more work you can do to improve your communication, to get it as close to where your technical skills already are, that's that's like the alpha for you. That's the opportunity for you. Um, and, you know, I think more and more har hardware, robotics, hard engineering founders are starting to realize the importance of that communication, that storytelling, that customer obsession. Uh, I'm really glad you called that out. And, and I love that you highlight it. Um, 20 years later, after my tech career, I started as an engineer who just wanted to build cool stuff, don't want to do sales conversations, think sales is silly, just want to build and push the edge of technology. 20 years later, you know, it's the adage, every sufficiently senior job is a sales job. All you're doing is selling. And that includes selling, yes, of course, customers and earning revenues and building a business, but it's selling executives on the direction you think is going to win those customers. It's selling people to come recruit and join your teams. As you're scaling a company fast, recruiting becomes a long pole and you have to bring people in. And then it's selling the organization you've built on what the North Star is so that they all move in the same direction. So storytelling becomes it, and, and vision setting and, and leadership and bringing people along, selling them on, on where you should go. And by the way, selling is not just shouting into a void, right? Selling is listening, right? The best salespeople understand, what do you want, Jay, right? Why are we talking? What yeah. is it that would solve your problem? And then thinking, am I the person to solve that problem? And if not, could I be? And how might I like, so that's a, way of approaching the world that if you get great at that, you're going to be a successful founder. And I think great engineering leaders do that, right? And yeah. learn to do that. And it's totally a, a trainable skill. You just have to put the reps in, put the time in. Uh, so we're, we're always looking for that. Yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest transitions I, I see engineering founders make to have to go into sales. And then for, for those of our, our listeners who are sort of at that phase, I'll tell you what, there is one other difficult transition coming around the corner, which is okay, now I've learned sales and I'm really focused on it. And now to go from a sales focused CEO to actually being a management CEO and hiring a sales team under you and empowering them where you don't have to be on every sales call. That's another transition that happens. I mean, look, as an investor, it's fun to see the founders like really level up their game. I'm sure if you're in the in the thick of it, where you're trying to balance both of these, um, you know, as a founder, it's not it's not the easiest thing. On the topic of first time founders, are there things that you see you know, first time founders building in hardware and robotics um, do maybe wrong or do too do, do slowly that you feel like repeat founders are doing a lot better. What are the repeat founders doing that first time founders can be learning from? I will say um, a repeat founder has just stubbed their toe a lot, right? So they'll understand, and, and it's maybe related to my key takeaway from product management. If you ask me to distill product management into like two sentences, It'd probably be great storytelling. We just had that conversation and amazing focus, right? Pick one thing and do it well and, and know what it is and why. Uh, and I think repeat founders know that, right? When they're confronted with, oh, look, my company could be applicable to these five market areas. Um, they know that they have to pick one and focus. It's maybe okay to explore five for a while, but if you keep exploring five for six months, like time, time kills companies if you, it's not time spent on a focus area. So I think probably a repeat founder just understands the, the urgency of time at early stages and the value of focus 
and therefore lining the whole organization up on things that matter and, and ignoring things that don't. I, I just read, it may have been this morning on Twitter, somebody was saying as a founder, one of the things they learned is that you've got to let some fires burn. Now, first time founders sometimes have that too, you know, whether by virtue of being lucky or thinking hard or, or surrounding themselves with great advisors who have themselves stubbed their toes. So focused on the focus lesson because of the times when I screwed it up, <laughs> right? That's the experience yeah. piece. Yeah. I'll, I'll click in on that too. Cause I, I often tell founders, you know, you have to understand who your audience is, right? And it comes a little bit back to our storytelling standpoint on, on this like prioritization point. When you are telling one story to investors where they want to hear that you're going to conquer the world, this is going to be one of the, you know, hundred most important companies and anybody's your customer and everybody is, you know, the, the target market. And sure, that's a, that's a good story to tell on one hand. That is not the story you can be telling your team because your team needs to hear from you. Hey, in the next 18 months, these are the customers we're serving. Here's the path that we're going down. And it's it's hard. I mean, I, I empathize with founders because you have to sort of hold two things simultaneously in your head, which is one day everybody is my customer. But today I serve this very small niche and I do that one thing really well. And uh, to your point, you know, whether first time or serial uh, entrepreneurs, um, the best folks have the ability to balance those two things. And I think it's, it's just an added aspect of prioritization, which is um, you have to be able to tell everybody what the 10 year vision is, but then focus them down to the next 12 months. I guess speaking to some of the challenges, you know, we, we talked about them at the top of our call, whether it was, you know, the, the capital stack, whether it was actually just having the team and talent to go and execute on the hardware and software, you know, point. I think we've got a pretty good answer at Alicorp. Alicorp's a pretty unique place. Um, because we build companies. So because we incubate companies, we think a lot about how do you go from zero to one where zero is like nothing, maybe a concept, some proof points in the market and a CEO to a company that's built and you've got an MVP in the market. Of course, we have, you know, partnerships that help with storytelling and comms. And that's important. We have uh, search recruiting at you know, teams at Alicorp that help us staff that team quickly, find go-to-market product, and leadership. We do a lot of executive CEOs, search and placement, and other C-suite. So that's great because team formation and for forming a phenomenal team is not easy and critically important. Um, and we bring that to bear for companies we invest in as well as companies we create. But the other really cool thing that we've got is um, Alicorp Engineering. So we have offices in Montreal and Columbia where we have amazing people who are ready to go to work on companies that we build or invest in. And again, that means, and I saw this all the time, you go raise some money. Great. I've got money. I have to staff a team. I can't spend that money until I have an engineering team. And that can take time, right? Sometimes labor markets are tight, but even when they're not tight, it's still hard to find the right people. You'll introduce a multi-month lag into actually getting moving in three months when you have an 18 month runway is a huge percentage of your likelihood of success. So Alicorp has engineering teams ready to go to staff onto our companies like that. And these people have worked together before. We know them. The bar is very high. They have machine learning, data science, uh, and, and other excellent background. And by the way, some of them are robotics people. Now, we have not created a robotics company before, but we're starting to get into this world of can we have our engineering team's ready to go and help on the robotics side. So I absolutely believe we will be bringing this to bear in our companies down the road. A few of these conversations are happening, like building and shipping is critically important. The other cool thing is we'll build up an expertise as we have in SaaS and healthcare and other areas, which will let our teams just kind of punch above their weight because they'll have been there, done that. Those are a few examples of what Alicorp brings beyond just having spent you know, pushing two decades in the world of building early stage companies and building strong networks around us. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I love that. We love to do the segment with our guests called Hyper Hopeful. Uh, so we're, we're at that juncture now. Uh, basically, I'm going to pick a trending topic uh, or two, and I will make a, a statement. Um, we'll say, is it hyper hopeful? And then I would love your, your quick fire thoughts. And if there's anything to unpack there, uh, then we'll go ahead and do that. Sound good? I love it. Let's do it. So AI-based solutions, AI is kind of the buzzword right now, but they're, they're often proposed um, really more and more in the context of the climate crisis and climate issues. Given the multidimensional nature of these problems, do you think AI integration in the climate fight is hype 
or hopeful? Absolutely hopeful. I'll start by saying that AI includes the things we were doing 10 and 15 years ago in Google research, right? Uh, when people say AI now, they often mean generative AI, LLMs, the, the fun, shiny stuff that's happening. But actually, there's workhorse AI that got going decades ago that really became almost tried and true a decade ago and is everywhere now. You know, that's that software that unleashes the hardware. So I know you looked at Earthforce. We're excited about them. They're out there helping prevent forest fire. What does that mean? That means that they have to identify and remove um, based on a forester prescription in compliance with regulations to prevent hurting endangered species and so on. They have to remove a whole bunch of vegetation from forests so that when the fires burn, you don't get these massive overburns and huge CO2 releases. Well, today we're doing this at such small scale because humans have to show up and walk the forest and mark trees with spray paint and, and, and string. And it's crazy. And what we're doing is showing up with AI that will have a forestry prescription given by a forester that will automatically identify the appropriate trees, guide the forester on the ground to get rid of this one, not that one. And at the scale of, you know, climate, which is hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres that need to be treated in this way, uh, give us proof about what happened and let us run algorithms and, and show like, if we do this, here's what happens. So I see it in every one of our companies is using AI to do what they do. All those companies we talked about earlier that are tackling climate in various ways could not do what they're doing without AI techniques. GPT and LLMs, maybe more on the hype side for robotics, but sure, I would love it to be hopeful. I'm an optimist, so I'm, yeah. I'll hold my breath and cross my fingers. And I know once these companies show what's possible and what works, every yeah. one of my companies will incorporate and apply these techniques and just get better. Part of the fun of doing this show is I'm learning how many optimists there really are out there. We, we get a lot of uh, we get a lot of hopefuls, very, very little hype um, to, on the topic of um, call it, you know, uh, human labor and, and blue collar industries, agricultural, transportation, manufacturing. They all promise to reduce waste and, and efficiency when it comes to integrating robotics. But then there's also real concerns about robots taking, you know, good paying human jobs. So on the whole, do you see this trend of robotics and blue collar industries as hopeful progress or potentially detrimental hype? Got to be hopeful all day long and really great specific example, which is working in a greenhouse is not always a fun job, right? These greenhouses can get to 110, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, extremely humid and it's hard labor. And as a result, as you'd imagine, people running greenhouses are labor constrained and greenhouses generate a lot of our, you know, healthy food, produce, vegetables. And by the way, when a Amazon warehouse shows up across the street from a greenhouse, almost every worker in that greenhouse runs across the street to work in the Amazon warehouse, which is maybe only 90 degrees and, you know, slightly less terrible. The, the fact is that there are a large number of jobs that humans don't want to do that the moment they don't have to do them, they choose not to do them with their feet. And everybody is chasing this labor, whether it's highly educated or blue collar labor. So I think that we just see as we automate jobs, people go work the next job, hopefully pays more, hopefully it's a better work environment. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think the added sort of component to that is, you know, where is robotics augmenting human labor? versus outright replacing it, right? And if and if those folks can still be working in the same industry, but don't have to be in the 120 degree, you know, uh, greenhouse, um, then then ultimately that's that's probably a, a better outcome for them and, and the folks in that industry. To jump in on that note, we have a huge thesis on human in the loop robots, right? Mm. Um, I, I think AI, I'll actually toss out hype. Um, AI is hype if people think it's going to completely replace humans and we'll have fully automated robots doing everything everywhere. We are so far from that. And I think even the shiniest AI is not going to enable that anytime soon. So I believe that it will make this robotic machinery easier to manage, more capable, but we will still need for decades and decades, humans minding it, controlling it, directing it, correcting it. Um, and those can actually be fun jobs. Certainly they can be jobs done in climate conditioned environments 
much yeah. better than a job out in a hot, hot, dusty field, or even frankly, in a, a dangerous, you know, remote forest location where if a fire does come up, it's hard to escape. And another really great example is in janitorial robots, where I've talked to people who have just stories of happy janitors who get to become robot minders. They're no longer pushing vacuums around. They're minding a robot fleet and they still can't hire enough people for these jobs. So I just think across the board, super hopeful about that human in the loop robots making jobs better. Let's uh, let's end our hyper hopeful talking about business models, because this is something uh, that, that I know you have some thoughts on robotics as a service as a viable business model to unlock robots in more of these industries. So sounds like a great idea at first. Then you realize that actually there's an additional layer of change management, not just how the customer is integrating the solution into their day to day, but also, you know, they've, they're used to paying for something upfront and having budget for it on an annual basis. And now we have to convince them to pay for it, you know, as a service on an ongoing basis. So looking at the next decade ahead, Abe, do we think we're going to see more ro I mean, robotics as a service companies? Is that hype or hopeful? I'll call this one hypeful. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> okay. be right in the middle. So the hype piece of it is there are industries where you're never going to sell them OpEx, right? And here I have companies selling to utilities. Uh, and this is just a, a virtue of law, how we regulate utilities, the fact that they're not kind of sort of really private companies. Utilities get to take CapEx spend and charge all of us for it. So if my local electric utility has a choice between buying a piece of robot equipment outright and paying a RAS service fee, even if that RAS fee is cheaper for them, they'd actually rather pay a lot of CapEx uh, reduce their profits accordingly and then go gouge me for it later. Uh, if not gouge, certainly put it into my you know rate increases. So I think that that's not going to change. This is where I'm a pragmatic optimist. I don't think you're going to change how utilities are regulated in the next decade or two. There's huge money to be made selling to utilities. They're going to buy CapEx in almost every situation. On the other hand, oil and gas, um, natural gas, other of these like energy generators, they love OPEX because they're under a different regulatory regime and they will happily buy RAS, right? So I think the answer is yes to both of them. And from my perspective, the key question for our companies is, are you capturing value, right? So the challenge with the CapEx sale is you might not capture all the value that you create. You don't want to become a commodity producer of hardware. One is it's less fun as a business owner, right? That pushes down margins and makes it a less interesting business to invest in. So you could say selfishly, of course, I'd say that. But I actually think it's larger than that. These are not hardware businesses, right? A robotics business is not a hardware business today. It is a software business and software rots. And that's why the entire software industry moved away from shrink wrap licensed software to software as a service. And that makes sense because you need that software maintained. You need security updates you needed to work with the new you know, databases that come out. It just has to keep improving year on year. And if it's not, as a business, you probably don't want to bet on it. And I think we're all totally accustomed to paying subscription fees for core pieces of our businesses. I think that these robotic solutions become that as well. And that's where you're paying a service fee for this part of your workflow, right? Part of your workforce is now this robotic system. You want that thing to get better every year and you certainly don't want it to break and you don't want the company to go out of business. You get that by supporting these, these RAS business models. So even on the CapEx side, you have to make sure that you do have a meaningful you know, maintenance contract that enables that. Yeah, it's, it's been one of the most interesting things for me as an investor in this category, um, coming from, I'd say, doing mostly software uh, to now you know, integrating more of these into my portfolio. And having those customer conversations, um, you know, perspective and current customers is so important to just realize, like, you can want everything that a company is selling. And yet, if you're not aligned on the business model, then that sale becomes so much harder. And the utilities example was was fantastic for that. Um, you know, Abe, one of the things I really love about following you on on social is how many cool like reports and newsletters and things that I, I see you uh, reading and sharing in the robotics world. Where do you go to find these things? How do you stay up to date given all the advancements that are happening? A, a call for people who know what I should be reading that I'm not because I'm absolutely missing things. 
I actually think that this is an underreported, understoried part of the market. I think it's nascent in early days for robotics and automation. Uh, and I think we need more people showing up and helping tell the stories and, and getting stuff out there. So it's great to have you, Jay, and, and your team at VSC paying attention. Um, certainly, there's some classics. Brian Heater's phenomenal at the Actuator at TechCrunch. Um, the robot report's great. So I just go read the obvious stuff. Um, and then I'm collecting a list of all the cool kids on Twitter, on LinkedIn, playing with the new threads thing. I, I hear we have to do that. Um, and, and just seeing what they're up to. But also just talking to academia, right? It's kind of cool what's happening in robotics in an academic setting. That doesn't mean that that's what we're going to put into our you know startups tomorrow. But it's interesting to see what they're working on and what they're publishing and writing about. So yeah. I'd say... You know, one of my secret weapons is I love reading and I get so deep into the spaces I get excited about. So I'm just always looking around. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think that's the, the most fun aspect of sort of being in this category now is I think a lot of investors are realizing um, there isn't a ton of differentiation when it comes to standard SaaS, right? The, the era of SaaS that we were all in for so many years is kind of past us. And so uh, for those of us that are a little bit earlier to this and recognizing Hey, actually, the really cool stuff is happening in the world of of atoms, not bits, and hardware, and robotics, and hard industry. Um, it's really cool to to kind of uh, to, to you know follow some of these writers and uh, be a part of you know creating content that elevates uh, these conversations. I will compete all day long with our robotics content against SaaS content, right? You know, there's only so many ways you can talk about a shiny CRM, and I love my CRM, and it really works. But boy. A robot that's inspecting a electric pipeline under New York makes for a really cool video, right? It's a great point, too, because I think from a visual content standpoint and a visual storytelling standpoint, um, that's definitely one thing that robotics companies uh, have going for them. So we'll, we'll close, like I said, where we'd love to close with all of our guests. There's a lot of doom and gloom out there when it comes to climate anxiety, lack of climate action. Uh, but as you've uh, shared, you're, you're quite optimistic. You're quite hopeful guy. So help me understand what is one thing that gives you hope and optimism um, about this fight against climate change? I, I just fundamentally believe that humans work the problems that matter and fix them, right? And I think that we rise to the challenges that we're given it doesn't mean it will be pretty or fun, uh, but I believe that we will, and I believe that we will because we must. So there's a little bit of a tautology in this, um, but it's certainly what I've chosen to put a lot of energy into. I talk to people working these problems all day long, and there is nothing like an anti-doomerist pill that you can take, like talking to a couple hundred founders who are building companies. And when you look at what they're building, you realize if a third of them succeed, we've put a dent in the problem. And if they all succeed, we're, we're moving on the way. Because nobody's telling the story about who's working on something now that's going to matter in 10 years, 20 years. And we almost can't imagine that. And so I just completely believe that these people we're talking to, some of them are going to make it work. And that's really going to going to matter. You're absolutely right. Getting to do what we do. I mean, it's so special um, to see the founders that are building the future. And even if we can't, you know, fund all of them for one reason or another, um, the hope that that each of those conversation injects uh, wants us to, you know, keep finding more founders. And I, and I know that because we share a portfolio company, we've looked at some companies together. Um, that is so evident in uh, basically every company out of the Alley Robotics portfolio. So I want to thank you so much for joining me on Climb today, uh, for sharing your perspective, for sharing your lessons. And uh, hey, here's to, here's to finding a few more deals for uh, us to do together in the near future. You got it. It's a pleasure, Jay. Thank you so much for the time. Well, that's all for this week's episode of Climb by VSC. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Special thanks to Credo for their help in producing and promoting this episode. To visit any part of today's conversation, again, you can find the full transcript on vscventures.com. Our thanks to Josue Ramiro for posting these every week. Lastly, if you've listened this far, please leave us a rating on Spotify or review on iTunes. It only takes a few seconds, really helps us out, and as far as I know, it's still carbon neutral. Well, that's all for now. We'll see you all next week on Climb by VSC.